the organization of the ah. what's that? Can I remove this? Ah, yes, sorry. Yeah. I used that in the recording. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, and then I will give you some examples uh, from the lab about the dynamics of recurrent networks. And then um, briefly mention some results of a simulation study in which we try to implement realistic cortical um, processes into a artificial neural network, a recurrent network. I will give you the address of a talk tomorrow where Felix Effenberger will uh, talk about this in detail. So the conclusion overall will be that the biological systems <clears throat> perform analog computations, computations that share numerous similarities with what quantum computers also do. And I hope this will become clear as I go on. Uh, <clears throat> now, cognitive systems, they need very efficient mechanisms for the evaluation and encoding of relations. Why? Because the world is composite in nature, and uh, the richness of the world results from the combination of components. So cognitive systems need efficient strategies to encode the components, the features on the one hand, but they also need to encode the relations among the features because we have a combinatorial code. Uh, mind you that 26 letters suffice to write the world literature and the world is arranged in very much the same way. So. One question is, is there a difference between natural intelligence systems and artificial systems? And if you compare those two um, so-called intelligent systems, an autonomous housefly with a few tens of thousands of neurons and a supercomputer, you will immediately, intuitively have the impression that there must be something very different between the two. And I will try to elaborate a little bit those differences. Now, the simplest way to encode relations is, of course, to establish physical connections among the units that represent the components. And this is a strategy that is realized in virtually all natural systems, and it is the prevailing principle in artificial systems as well, particularly in the deep learning network. So it's the perceptron principle. If you have detectors for component A and the component B, and you want to encode the presence of A and B, um, the best is to construct a conjunctive specific neuron, C in this case, by uh, recombining inputs to this conjunctive specific neuron, tweak the gain so that this unit will become active only and only if A and B are the case. Very simple principle, several decades old, and now scaled up in the topology of the deep neural networks. They are just the scaling up of the same principle, Activity flows from an input stage um, where you have the feature detectors and then it's relayed over multiple layers until finally there are arrays of output units. And by iteratively tweaking the gain of these connections, one can make sure that the particular input vector leads to the preferential activation of a readout unit on the output. So it's a mapping operation and um, the it's simply I strictly feed forward, um, and the learning is done, as you all know, by backpropagation. So, um, an interesting thing is that these uh, deep neural networks, they share certain similarities with the organization of the mammalian visual system. There is some indication for serial processing in, in uh, natural systems, in cerebral cortex, for example. Then if one, analyzes the receptive field properties, the response properties of the nodes of these artificial systems when they are trained to recognize patterns. They share some similarities with the receptive fields that we see in higher levels of the visual hierarchy. And the efficiency with respect to the identification of particular patterns, objects, is rather similar. And this has seduced quite a number of my colleagues to think that now we have solved the problem. Now we know how the brain works. And um, I will show you that this is not the case because there are fundamental differences. And um, here are the main differences when regards the cerebral cortex, uh, features that are missing in deep neuronal networks. First, we have massive recurrence within and between the layers. All these layers are reciprocally coupled and the nodes within the layer also reciprocally coupled. <clears throat> 
Then the node the natural systems, they have the propensity to oscillate, very important feature. Then the connections between the nodes, both between within layers and across layers, they are endowed with adaptive synapses, heavy synapses that change the gain of the connections as a function of, of uh, temporal correlations. So natural systems exploit the temporal dimension for computations, which is not the case in the uh, DNNs. So here's an example, uh, a canonical circuit in the, um, in the cerebral cortex, because cerebral cortex is very, very um, homogeneous. It looks more or less the same in, in all the regions. Um, you have a certain amount of feed-forward connections. They are depicted in blue here that relay input from sensory uh, surfaces onto uh, neurons in, in a particular layer, layer four here. And from there on, activities relayed onto these uh, pyramidal cells in the supergranular and the superficial layers and in the deep layers. And these cells, the green ones, they all have action collaterals that traverse tangentially and issue a reciprocal coupling among the neurons in these columns. These neurons are feature selective. Um, and these connections are very prominent and they make up for about 80% of the synaptic contacts in cortex. So it's the recurrence is an extremely important organizational principle. So um, the consequences, uh, <clears throat> oh, an important feature is that these horizontal connections, these reciprocal connections, they are adaptive. And they are shaped by experience. They change their gain as a function of experience. And the consequence is that the weight distributions that the system ends up with reflect the statistical contingencies of features in the outside world. They serve as priors for all the subsequent processes of information um, processing. Um, as I already mentioned, the rules according to which these collaterals change their synaptic gain is a heavy rule, it's a correlation rule. So neurons that often fire together, they eventually fire together. Connections between neurons that have a high probability of being activated in temporal contingency, in if they display correlated activity, they tend to get more strongly coupled by neurons that are rarely active in a correlated way, they, the connections among them get weakened. So the, um, since these neurons are feature selective, um, neurons that code for features which have a high probability of co-occurring in, in the natural environment, they get coupled more strongly in neurons that code for features that are rarely uh, connected in the outside world, they become less strongly coupled. So you have a, a rearrangement of connections initially there is virtually all to all connection in, in the in this Ricard network and after experience then you get more selective um, connections between neurons that respond to features whose occurrence in the outside world is correlated i spare you the evidence but this is very robust findings now this principle is scaled up it holds also for the communication between the large number of different cortical areas that deal with vision, with audition, with all sorts of uh, different functions, depending on the input they get. And here's an example uh, for the connectivity graph of um, the visual system. So all these red dots, they stand for large cortical areas that have billions of cells inside. Um, belonging to the, the visual system and then to some executive systems uh, controlling attention and controlling eye movements. So it's only a small subset of the areas that we can identify in the visual, in the cortex of, in this case, a macaque monkey. And all these white lines here, they stand for massive reciprocal um, axonal connections. So you see that um, if, there is very little indication for a serial processing in here. What prevails is reciprocity, distributedness, and the soft hierarchy. If you know your way in this connectome, you can come from any neuron, let's say from in this visual area here, 
to any other neuron in these areas with one or two switching stations, either the direct connections or there's one or two synaptic uh, steps in between. So it's a scaling up of the principle of coupling recurrent networks recurrently. Um, there's a very important feature of, of these cortical columns or these microcircuits that they have the propensity to oscillate. We know the microcircuit that is responsible for it. Um, these are excitatory neurons. They feed into inhibitory neurons. They feed back onto these excitatory neurons. And the inhibitory neurons are also mutually coupled reciprocally. And such a microcircuit has the uh, propensity to oscillate. They are identified and uh, a constitutive property of cortical networks. So here is a very, very simplified graph of the system that we are dealing with. We have nodes or columns that are feature selective. Um, depending on in which modality you are, it's either frequency selective neurons or it's uh, contour selective neurons and so forth. These nodes have the propensity to oscillate when activated. When they are bumped, they go into a relaxation oscillation. They are coupled reciprocally. And these couplings are anisotropic. There is some nearest neighbor rule Nearby columns tend to always interact, <clears throat> but further distant interactions are selectively coupling <clears throat> neurons or columns that have uh, sensitivities for features whose occurrence in the normal environment is co occurrence is frequent, as I have just mentioned. So it's a, a recurrent network that is anisotropic with respect to the coupling weights. Um, it's delay coupled because these are not electrical wires. It's not light speed. This is uh, conduction times or conduction velocities of one or one to, to 10 meters per second. So it's very slow. So the coupling here is with delay, whereby the delay increases with distance. And very important, the propensity to oscillate. And you can imagine that um, there's another layer in this network that I have just shown you, another red dot. And um, these local networks are reciprocally coupled um, across the soft hierarchy of the system. So some evidence, if you record from a cluster of neurons, activate them, they engage in such rhythmic activity bursts that in the envelope look like, uh, yeah, some some oscillatory activity, and this is ubiquitous. One sees it everywhere in very different frequencies. So this is a constitutive property of nervous systems. Um, so because these columns are reciprocally coupled, um, they tend to synchronize if they are coactivated. Um, as the Arnold Tang uh, theorem shows, or the Kuramoto formula, at least. Um, so if you record from two spatially segregated sites, activate those columns with a continuous stimulus, a single object, uh, run a cross correlogram of the discharges, you see this nicely modulated uh, synchronous activity. Um, and one see, observes this phenomenon within the cortical area, across areas, and also across the two hemispheres of the brain. So synchronization probability, does reflect the strength of the coupling among uh, the coupled nodes. Now, since this coupling strength reflects the statistical contingency of features in the natural world, uh, neurons which respond to statistically related features tend to synchronize more than those which respond to something that is uncorrelated in the outside world. So the consequence is if one activates two columns, that are selective, for example, for collinear line uh, orientations, contours with collinear line orientations, which occurs very frequently in the natural visual world. Uh, you have these uh, continuous contours. Um, B columns synchronize, as you can see here. Um, however, if one activates those contours with something that is incoherent, like um, a bar moving from uh, right to left, and another one moving from left to right. Uh, this is clearly two different unrelated objects. 
neurons no longer synchronize. They feel response, but they don't get activated because the, the architecture does not foresee strengthened connections between columns that code for different directions of motion. So um, the conclusion from this is that the relations among features are encoded by temporal correlations. Very important point. Uh, and that neurons responding to related, i.e. to groupable features, they synchronize their responses. Um, and the relations uh, between features are encoded by temporarily cooperating ensembles of neurons. Um, and this allows for a very flexible combinatorial code uh, that economizes hardware. Um, remind you, a deep learning network requires for every possible relational constellation a specific conjunction of specific neurons. They are called labeled line codes. So this leads to a combinatorial explosion if you want to encode all possible relations among all possible components in this way. Here, you can do it flexibly by escaping into the temporal dimension for coding for relations. So <clears throat> the problem that these cognitive systems have to solve is illustrated here. Um, here you have to make the right grouping of features. Right? You have to connect this black surface to this white surface, but you shouldn't connect it to the black surface of the meadow over here. And if you do this correctly, you will, after a while, discover seven horses. Now, I don't give you the time, um, but the principle that acts here is that depending on context, on the embedding context, you can have synchronization between columns coding for features A, B, and C, establishing a transitory uh, dynamic relation among them through cooperativity. And in the next um, picture, context may be different. You can use the same feature coding elements, but as a, arrange them in different assemblies. Establish a relation between feature A and B and feature D and C. And this is very flexible and transient. So you have a combinatorial code for the uh, encoding of relations that uh, is dynamic and exploits the temporal co coherence as, as um, the signature. So if you, um, if you solve this problem here, which is which your original system it takes a few hundred milliseconds usually to do that, um, you end up with neural assemblies that code for the first horse and they are coherent it doesn't have to be very periodic, but there needs to be some coincidence between the discharges of the neurons uh, for the first horse and for the second horse. You have another assembly that it gets, that is also cooperating. Now, <clears throat> and I want to take you beyond synchrony um, because recurrent networks with oscillating nodes and anisotropic coupling, they generate exceedingly complex high-dimensional nonlinear dynamics, and these can be exploited for a host of different computations. And I'll give you a few examples. So this is in a, in a network model that will be explained more tomorrow more in more detail by Felix Effenberger. Um, I will give you the coordinates of this lecture room later. Um, this is what you see when you record also in, in vivo from these different columns complicated oscillatory patterns, very hard to interpret. But I will give you interpretations a little bit later. So the working hypothesis that we are pursuing, or have been pursuing for quite some time, was that stimuli or sensory evidence that matches the priors that fit in the weight distributions of this recurrent network cause a very rapid descent from high dimensional resting state activity to low dimensional substates um, that are stimulus specific. So these substates are equivalent with the results of a Bayesian matching operation in which sensory evidence is compared with the residence priors that sit in the network. And there is this rapid collapse of a very high dimensional ongoing spontaneous activity into into a substate that has a lower, lower dimensionality and can be classified quite easily with linear classifiers. Now, this is the idea behind the following slides. 
Um, now let, let me give you some examples so that you get a feeling for what recurrent networks buy you. Um, if they are uh, perturbed, they respond with relaxation activity, traveling waves, uh, damped oscillations. So the, the trace of a transient, transient stimulus remains in the network for a while. This predicts that it should be possible to superimpose temporary disjunct information in the network and still read it out after all the stimuli are gone. Like if you throw stones into a pond of water um, at different sites with different energy, if you, as long as the waves propagate, you can read from this interference pattern exactly the history that has happened before by just uh, registering phase, amplitude, and wavelength. You can reconstruct what has happened. So this can also be shown be true in the natural systems. So what the procedure usually is, one looks for a cortical area, it doesn't really matter for which one. Um, in this case, we took uh, the primary visual cortex, um, implant an uh, electrode drive that allows you to record over many man months from a num large number of neurons. These neurons have receptive fields, you can map them, and then present, uh, in this case, letters onto this cluster of receptive fields. You get a response vector, 60 cells responding um, with point processes. There's a time series. Every line here is a response of the neuron. And then you give stimuli, letter A, letter B, letter C at different times. Um, you want to decode this activity, so it is advantages to convolve it so to get a continuous signal. And we convolve it usually with a sort of function to mimic the uh, synaptic potentials. So you get a continuous signal, and then you throw in a linear classifier to identify, for example, this vector as being characteristic for the letter B. Um, and usually you can decode from 16 neurons with 90% uh, certainty what the stimulus has been. Now one can test whether the superimposition of uh, information takes place in these networks. Yes, it does. Uh, we show a letter A, uh, and of course, you can decode letter A while the, the neurons respond to, to this letter A, but also when the stimulus is already gone here, you can still decode it because there's persisting activity. You can then present the second letter, and you can, of course, also decode this uh, the identity of the second letter from the ongoing and tra trailing activity. And there is a moment in time where you can decode both letters. And you can even decode which what the sequence of the presentation was. So um, and, and sometimes these traces outlast a stimulus if there's no further disturbance for up to a second. So the first conclusion is um, recurrent dynamics permit to distribute the information of a particular stimulus across many nodes, because here we have evaluated population activity. And it allows the superposition of information from different stimuli that are temporarily disjunct. Um, people call this the fading memory that comes from reservoir computing. And one can still encode and decipher the sequence order. So this is a, a very nonlinear operation. Now, I told you that the priors are stored in the weight distribution of recurrent connections, or that's the hypothesis. And then one can investigate what happens if stimuli match or do not match these priors. The prediction is if stimulus-specific substates self-organize, because the network adds its own information to the incoming sense of evidence, then the classifiability of dynamic states should improve if one gives the network some time to process this incoming information. Moreover, if the priors are updated by repeated stimulus presentation, we call this perceptual learning or familiarization, classification should improve for familiar stimuli. And this is what you see. Um, Again, throwing a letter over these receptive fields, this is the responses of the ensemble of neurons 
So there's a first transient response, very fast, that is followed by reverberating activity. The stimulus is short, it's only here. And then you frame linear classifiers to decode stimulus identity from these high dimensional vectors. And the surprising finding here was that even though there is a lot of strong weight response, decodability of this primary sensory response is not so good, but it increases dramatically during this reverberating phase where the network can add its own information that is already stored there um, to, the, to the formation of the substate that is classified. Um, this is the blue line here. So very high decodability. Um, and for stimuli that have been shown very often, because these experiments last uh, over days, so the animal gets familiar with the stimuli. If one compares um, the classifiability of stimuli that are relatively new for the animal, you end up with this blue curve. But if you take trials after the animal has seen already thousands of these stimuli, decodability gets better as predicted. So why does this reverberation make it easier to classify stimulus identity? Um, if, we, if you do a principal component analysis of the population vector, you see that shortly after the stimulus, which is given, given here, um, the principal components still cluster for the three different stimuli that we try to distinguish here. Uh, but if you let the network evolve and elapse, time elapses, these clusters get separated very nicely, which facilitates, of course, classification. So information stored in the network combines with the sensory evidence, which usually is noisy and fast, and then the network, by yeah, um, mutual interactions among all those many nodes, uh, finds a substate that is relatively uh, stimulus specific, nicely stimulus specific, by separating the principal components of uh, these vectors. So, conclusions, um, network dynamics converge towards classifiable stimulus-specific substates, and they do this very quickly, in 100 milliseconds, the collapse occurs. Um, this convergence to, to the substates segregates stimulus-specific substates in a very high dimensional state space, so you can probably have representation of many different uh, objects or content in the same ensemble of neurons. And then if the system gets familiar with the stimulus, trials get adapted, and then um, substates become uh, more easily classifiable, they become more stimulus specific. So it's, it's a non-supervised updating of priors following these Hadian correlation rules. So if all this is the case, we can make another prediction. Um, it's already clear that resting state activity must somehow reflect the weight distributions of all these connections because it, it, it evolves in the, in the anisotropic network. Um, <clears throat> so if one imprints a particular prior or a particular configuration of features into this network by frequent exposure, then uh, the covariance structure of the spontaneous activity should change and it should um, assume some uh, specificity in this correlation structure that is related to the frequently seen stimuli before. Um, and one can actually show this um, by taking these high dimensional response vectors of the neurons and training in this way, now, in this time now, arrays of readout neurons uh, that uh, reproduce the brightness values of the real stimulus. And this can be done quite successfully, showing how reliable these neuronal responses are. And if you show a stimulus F and you take your array of readout neurons, they reproduce the F. Now, this is just for methodological reasons, it's easier to screen um, spontaneous activity if you already see something. So <clears throat> we train these classifier matrices for the different stimuli that the animal had seen before, these letters. And then looked into a spontaneous activity. A monkey does nothing, just sitting around, um, sometimes eyes closed, has no task, idling 
And what you see is that every now and then, um, and one sees this in the in the in the um, mass activity, there are bumps that are identifiable. This seems to be a signature of a network uh, converging to, towards something. When this happens, um, the decoders recognize the letters that the animal had seen so many times. Sometimes the decoder recognizes something which we cannot interpret. And uh, this is just a test. If we show the letter C in reality, uh, the, the, the vectors reproduce this C. So there is spontaneous replay of familiar patterns in the correlation structure. Um, so taking evidence that familiarization leads to similar specific modifications of network properties. And then due to the recurrent dynamics and the self-organizing, um, stimulus specific spatial temporal patterns reappear in the absence of stimulation. Um, and this phenomenon is called replay, it's known also in other structures that also have these recurrent properties like the hippocampus. So if the scientific irregularities of natural environments are stored in the weights of the recurrent connection, then it follows that natural scenes, which match these priors, could induce dynamic states that contain more stimulus-specific information than those induced by non-natural stimuli. Right? Um, the reason is that stored knowledge facilitates the convergence of networks to dynamic states towards stimulus-specific substates if there is a good match. Also, this can be shown. Um, one shows the monkey natural simile of this type, and then um, manipulates these natural scene stimuli, either by face scrambling or removing higher order uh, contingencies, um, making sure that the stimulus energy is exactly the same. And this is also proven by uh, the comparison of firing rates to these different stimuli, they are virtually identical. And also the reduction in noise that one always sees if one constrains the network with a stimulus it's exactly the same in the two conditions, but the decodability of the evoked vectors is much better for the vectors evoked by natural stimuli than it is for these scramble stimuli, confirming the hypothesis that um, if you tap the network with something that matches its distorted priors, uh, it converges uh, to more to less ambiguous substates. So, um, just to add that this improved decodability, as it is seen, is not due to changes in discharge rates, they are exactly the same, nor to an improvement of the signal to noise ratio. Um, we now have to find out what, <laughs> why these substates are more or more easily decodable. We haven't done this yet. So, a general conclusion so far is that the inclusion of time as coding dimension allows for highly efficient computations. And that nature, nature apparently opted for the lake coverage recurrent oscillator networks to exploit the temporal domain for computations. And the likely reason is that such networks possess particularly rich self organizing dynamics. You wouldn't get this without nodes that do not oscillate, that simply integrate. Now, before concluding, uh, a teaser for the talk of Felix tomorrow. Uh, about three years ago, we settled out um, to run a comprehensive simulation study. And the goal was to provide a theoretical basis for the functional benefits of exploiting the temporal dimension for computation. Um, and as physiologists, we were particularly interested in to see whether we could obtain post hoc explanations for the functional role of certain structural and functional properties of biological systems that we have observed that are described, but hard to interpret. Um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that the occurrence of oscillatory activity in the brain, even though one sees it everywhere, <clears throat> is still heatedly debated with respect to its functional implications. Uh, some people have called it the exhaust fumes of the running engine. So it's just a phenomenal and an unavoidable phenomenon that occurs because of gain control and inhibition, while others think that they are essential, but 
it's very hard to obtain causal evidence in vivo because if one interferes with um, the function of these nodes, one necessarily always alters so many different inter in intermediate parameters that it's very hard to isolate a single phenomenon and manipulate it. So the question was, um, are there any virtues with respect to recurrence? Do oscillations play a role? Is synchronization at all in, uh, a code? Um, do phase shifts uh, mean anything or is it epiphenomenal? Is this reverberation really used? And uh, how about the anisotropic coupling? Does it buy you something? And also do heavy and synapses buy you something at this level? So there's a number of questions that are unanswered, cannot be answered with physiological studies only, and therefore module simulation is the right way to go. So I summarize the features that we implemented um, in this uh, recurrent network. Uh, the first big step was to configure the nodes as damp harmonic oscillators. Um, then we coupled the nodes with delay because neurons conduct at finite speed, <clears throat> allowed the connections to be modifiable by a heavy mechanism. Now in the simulation, uh, in some simulations we implemented heavy synapses, time they buy you something, in general, the network was trained in an artificial way with back propagation through time, but it turned out that this training algorithm has exactly the same effect on network connectivity as if we had that heavy and synapses in there. So it's just a, a technical detour. Um, and then um, we also tried some in some experiments to store priors of the world in which the networks would have to perform later on in the weight distributions of recurrent connections by familiarizing the network with uh, just the statistics of the environment in which they would have to perform. Um, if they have to do letter recognition, it was oriented lines. Um, if they would have to do word recognition, one would probably use uh, the frequency spectrum of phonemes. But without telling the network at that stage what is going to but the task is that it has to solve later on. Um, so it's a sort of a learning that children go through when they explore the world and learn about um, the statistical nature of the contingency of, of features in this world. So essentially, um, we reproduced this network architecture and then looked for um, its function. So, what Felix and uh, Pedro, Pedro is also sitting here, did together in, over the last uh, two years or so, was picking a piece of visual cortex, visual cortex in this case, but could have been auditory cortex. Actually, <laughs> uh, I will show you, they, they used visual stimuli, but they have been scanned, line scanned, so that they uh, are given into the network as a time series. So. Um, it's actually auditory cortex would do the same thing. But it doesn't really matter uh, because these cortical areas all do the same thing. Uh, the function is only determined by their specific input and output connections. So, configuring the nodes as oscillators with the uh, known microcircuitry, and then <clears throat> train them, as I said, with back propagation through time, um, and then see what they, what they can do. And um, the great surprise was that implementing these biological ingredients massively boosted the network performance. So the most important step was to configure the nodes as damped harmonic oscillators. Um, but also endowing the nodes with different preferred frequencies, which is known to be the case in, in natural systems, helped. Introducing self-connections which are also known to exist in neuronal networks in the cortex, also helped, made it better. Um, introducing heterogeneous conduction delays also made it better. And pruning the recurrent connections by prior experience with the statistical regularities of the world in which the network would have to perform later also helped. So 
some examples, um, but the real ones you will see tomorrow um, in the talk by Felix. Um, we use standard uh, benchmark tests, in this case, the MNIST test, compared it with other um, recurrent networks that are implemented in the moment in these artificial intelligence systems. So the long short-term memory um, of Schmidhuber is this blue trace. Uh, the gated recurrent unit is this yellow trace. And um, this green trace here is our network. Um, this compares the number of parameters required in order to reach a certain level of performance. And you see that this network uh, is much more economic with respect to invested hardware if you were to build such a system. Uh, but more importantly is uh, learning speed. Um, this natural network, or naturally inspired by biology network, is uh, this here. This is the homogeneous version of the network. So no conduction delays, uh, same oscillation frequencies in all nodes is performing here as a function of training steps. So you see already here, it is much better, uh, requires much less training steps than uh, the rivalrous uh, networks. The, the tandem stage network is actually not yet doing anything reasonable after 10,000 learning steps. And here you see the, the great increase in efficiency when the network is made in homogeneous, when oscillation frequencies of the nodes are different and when conduction uh, velocities are uh, spread out. More about this tomorrow. Um, also with respect to noise tolerance, this physiologically inspired network is surprisingly good. Uh, if there's little ambiguity, little noise, uh, they're all about the same, uh, the LSTM and the glue. But when noise increases, um, no collapse, they fail. But the biologically inspired network is still doing super well. Um, there are reasons we can discuss them. Um, what these biologically inspired networks do is very much the same as what the visual cortex would do if we exposed a newborn kitten for the first time to the visual world. Uh, in the beginning, the connections are all to all, um, with connection strength being relatively uh, low. But with experience, i.e. with training, with exposure to natural figures, in this case was, I think, Emmy's lecture, um, you see that the connectivity matrix becomes anisotropic. There is an increase of um, coupling strength that is selective between particular nodes. Um, connectivity as a whole becomes more local, which is natural because the stimuli have local vicinity uh, relations. Um, and some connections become stronger and others become turned down. So the network reconfigures itself very much in the same way as would be a, a piece of cortex in a kitten exposed for the first time to the visual world. Um, and you see this also in the uh, correlation matrix of the activity. In the beginning, when a network hasn't learned anything, um, all to all connections not yet pruned, um, the activity is characterized by, by rather global synchronization patterns. They are boring, they don't contain much information. Um, it's also a warning to physiologists who are very much into oscillations. Uh, whenever you see them, <laughs> it means that the cortex doesn't do much. Um, after training, you get a much more fine-grained, sophisticated landscape of local coherent patches separated by uh, regions of, of uh, less coherence, less amplitude. Um, so you get a high dimensional but structured um, activity pattern. And um, this is the last example. Um, at the very end, uh, because I am a visual physiologist, um, I asked Felix and Pedro, why don't you flash just the stimulus onto the matrix of nodes uh, activating those nodes which happen to lie under the contours of the of the object that has to be recognized. 
And so they did, and this is what the network does, and you will recognize immediately that you have seen this already in physiology before, uh, brief stimulus, uh, some transient response, but then um, there is reverberation in the network that builds up and forms a very complex uh, spatiotemporal landscape pattern uh, that can be read out in the stimulus specific. Um, so you have seen this before, uh, initial transient response, not very information rich, let the network work a little bit, add its own knowledge, and then you can get a very nice stimulus specific uh, response vector. So again, these are the responses that you get for one of these letters, and these are the responses that you get for another one. Um, not knowing what is behind it, you would not be able to interpret anything of what this. And this is the fallacy that the physiologists fight with. We sample neurons, they do something, of course, they do also have receptive fields, but um, unless there's a strong concept behind it, you can't interpret this activity at all. So here are the coordinates for the lecture tomorrow. Um, Sala is only with one L, I think, in, in Spanish. <laughs> it's in Sala. Sala is 11 o'clock for those who want to hear more about it. Um, so the question is now, what is the representation of a cognitive object? Um, and it's not at all what we subjectively feel it should be, because it is a very complex, high-dimensional landscape in phase space um, distributed over many different cortical areas because they all collaborate in order to present what we consider as a seen reality to us. And these landscapes are sculpted by peaks of synchrony that are separated by relatively incoherent and highly active zones segregated by less active regions. Uh, so it's an extremely complex pattern that also can exploit phase space. So it's a very, very large space, a uh, space that can be can be used. And this is a slightly <laughs> um, counterintuitive idea that what seems so concrete and so well defined in front of our mind's eye is a widely distributed, uh, very dynamic spatial temporal pattern, a cloud of activity formed by billions of neurons that sit in different regions of the brain and all collaborate. And how this the system is processing, you can see in this, or deduce from the fact that um, if you present an auditory stimulus, a word, for example, you can read out the identity of the word by recording from the visual cortex. So these areas always all talk together. So nicely, the network reproduces virtually the whole phenomenology of yeah, natural network. So I skip this. Um, I talked about learning speed, noise tolerance, and so forth. For neurobiology, it's important because it emphasizes the importance of recurrent connections, the emphasis is the, on oscillating nodes, the self connections, and the conducting delays, heavy and synapses, of course. Now, the reasons for good performance is first the very high dimensional dynamic space offered by these systems, then, computations are analog and allow for a parallel search of many, many variables to compare them simultaneously with each other, pretending a little bit in the neural process, uh, like in a movie machine. And this, again, has resemblances to what quantum computers do, except that they are the uh, are encoding in spin. Here it is phase, so it's equivalent. So after all this, um, conclusion is, yes, Complements to evolution. Uh, fly uses a completely different strategy because it built according to the same principles. And remains to say thank you to my collaborators. Those are more on the experimental side. Here are the um, people who know to deal with uh, partial differential equations, which is completely opaque to me. Uh, Felix will talk tomorrow. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, so yeah, I, I come here. So thanks, uh, 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 so questions in the audience? Yeah, this one over here. A um, couple of questions. So one is, 
I remember there's this old uh, idea from Simon Thorpe that if you check in the in inferotemporal cortex uh, for phase recognition neurons, the time delays are uh, basically you can just do it with one spike. So basically, what his argument was that since I see neurons that basically that that encode phases at at a given at a time that only allows one delay, uh, then that would somehow um, basically you cannot not have be using the recurrence in that case yeah um yeah which is i guess the trade-off of uh using time then you need to wait so yeah can you yeah, yeah what we what we saw in other experiments i had no time to do to, to dwell on them is that if you present the stimulus for the first time what you really see is that activity propagates sequentially through the processing hierarchy can't be otherwise so there are synaptic delays and conduction delays. But then once the activity, once the signal is in the network, um, while the network searches for a solution, so the case I'm alluding to is a, a surface of garbo patches that are randomly arranged, and you could change a few of them, um, some of them become collinear, and then you, you see a shape. And when this shape appears, you just modify a few of the patches somewhere, which doesn't do much to the system as a whole. Then all of a sudden, there is a response coming virtually simultaneously in V1, in V4, probably in the high areas as well. We haven't looked. So <clears throat> once the evidence is in the system, um, it becomes independent of all this stuff that comes from outside. Searches for a solution, and this solution is simultaneous in, in all the interconnected areas. Okay, any other short question? Gaston, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I was trying to make in the link between uh, uh, what you just show uh, today and the uh, uh, P300 uh, experiment that are typically doing on brain computer interfaces where you have a stimulus and then you have a response uh, when you uh, have, when you see some letters. In those kind of experiments, uh, I think that the, this familiarization process is not really there. I mean, you don't you don't have a learning effect. The performance is pretty much stable over time. Uh, so, uh, according to your experience, can you try to make a, a sort of link between uh, uh, the Petrian that uh, evoked the response in the brain and what you have shown uh, today? Um, I don't know. Uh, it could be that the Petrian is this, this moment of convergence where you have a lot of evidence distributed in many different areas is put together. I wouldn't be able to know now. Uh, just out of curiosity, another another very uh, um, uh, another question that I had is uh, uh, so sometimes people ask, well, is the brain really works as a computer, right? So, uh, and I think that really the last parts of your talk, unfortunately, you, you didn't have the time to develop, but uh, talks about evolution, the role of development in the in the brain. So, according to you. Uh, could it be that the really the main difference why the brain is not working uh, as a computer is uh, the fact that maybe even uh, in a computer the cables are you know are installed printed on a motherboard in the brain you have the development in which the roles are encoded rather in the in the genes and then basically that's the reason why every brain is not developing the same way we have some variability yeah, can it really be the difference why the strategy is really radically different this is an analog computing uh, strategy in the brain. Um, the spikes are just a nice thing to have if you want to propagate activity over long distances, and it's also noise reducing because it's thresholding. But in essence, it's an analog computer. Uh, it has nothing to do with the artificial network systems that we, we know. We, where time plays no role whatsoever. Um, they are clocked in the computer time. So it's a radically different strategy, and it's probably discovered early on in evolution because the same motifs of recurrency are found in all sorts of nervous systems, also very primitive ones. It's a, evolution has, has its own trick. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, well, we have to start the next uh, the next session now. So well, let's thank the speaker again.